Hi, I'm Rob Cosin. Welcome to my shop. Today's video, I'm going to show you how to turn a chisel handle. If you're interested in making some beautiful chisel handles like this, stay tuned. I'm going to walk you through the entire process. I'm Rob Cosman, and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new to our channel, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell, which will alert you whenever we release a new video. Anytime we use a new tool or technique, we'll leave a description down below so that make it easier for you to find. All right, let's get back to work. I'm going to show you how to make a handle for an IBC chisel. And what's unique about it is the fact that you can use any wood. Whereas normally, something like this, which is African blackwood, will withstand being hit with a mallet. This is a piece of desert ironwood, and that would certainly withstand being hit with a mallet. But this is a piece of uh, soft maple burl. And you hit that, and it's going to get dented up, may even break. But the IBC chisel is built like this. You take, you twist it off, and there is an um, aluminum end cap. There's a connector rod, there's a ferrule, and there's the chisel itself. Nice thing about that, by the way, is when you're preparing your chisels initially, that'll lay flat on your stone without any interruptions. Your ferrule's on there to help transfer the force. And then after you've bored a hole through your blank, there's a connector rod that is fastened to an aluminum cap. So all of this gets squeezed together, so you're hitting on the aluminum cap, and it's not going to hurt the wood at all. So you can have a very light chisel with a, maybe a pine handle, or if you're not concerned at all about the uh, weight, you could do some really pretty woods like this piece of African blackwood. But the design allows you to do that. It's simply a matter of taking your blank, drilling the hole, and then turning it on the lathe. And that's the part I'm going to take you through. And those same techniques can be used for a chisel handle on just about any other chisel, providing it's a durable enough wood. So next thing we're going to do is get that blank out, go through and show you some wood choices, and then we'll keep going from there. Now I've got some beautiful chisel handles here. I have a good friend named Ahmed who's also an excellent craftsman, and his favorite pastime is turning beautiful handles and sending them to me. I'm going to go through and show you some of these, and I'll show you what we're going to make ours out of. So this is Sindora Burl, which comes from Malaysia, I believe? No, oh, Cambodia. This is Osage Orange, yet it's yellow. This is uh, Asian Satinwood Burl. This is Black and White Ebony, more white than black. This is Western Maple Burl. That's the one I showed you earlier. This is a piece of desert ironwood, which is just takes on a beautiful polish. Love that wood. African black wood. A little bit of grain, but not much. This is the most incredible pink, pink ivory that I have ever seen. It usually doesn't come out as pink as that is, and that's not been enhanced at all. These all just have a clear finish on them. This is a piece of uh, fiddleback, um, uh, fiddleback catalogs also known as Mexican Rosewood. This is a piece of Amboynia Burl, extremely expensive, really pretty wood. And some of these I don't have handled on. This is a piece of Desert Ironwood Burl. Here's a piece of Macassar Ebony. You might, might know this one. This is a piece of Zebra Wood. This is a piece of Cocobolo, sometimes even more colorful than that. And this is a piece of Mazer Birch. So what I'm gonna use if you see on my bench here, I've got a piece of highly figured, uh, what we would call fiddleback maple. And we're going to cut a piece of that off. I almost hate cutting into this stuff for fear of wasting any. So what I'll do is I'll cut a piece off the end, and we need for a blank uh, three and three eighths of an inch. So I'm not going to cut much more than that. We'll process most of it on the bandsaw so that we can get away from having to surface it and just square it up. It's going to be turned in the lathe anyway. So we'll cut a piece off here that's three and three eighths, and then we'll square it up. We need to start with a with a blank that is an inch and five sixteenths square. Okay, this end is square, so I'm going to come over three and three eighths. Maybe just a little. I'll save the line. That'll allow me to square up the ends. It's easier to do that while it's a square blank. Just eyeballing that to get it right on. Okay, I'm on the inside tooth, I'm going to have that showing almost, or I should say just beyond inch and three-eighths. That edge is not perfectly square, 
that one is. We'll flip it over and do this side. I've got the fence down so that it's just clearing. And while we're here and set up, we'll do a couple. Now, see if one side looks any better than the other. Sometimes there's a little more figure showing on one side and it really doesn't look to be any different, so. All right, so there's our two squares. Now I'm gonna go over, actually I think I'm going over to the, my shooting board and I'm gonna square up these two ends. So first thing I'll do is get one side nice and flat. And then I'll square this side to it. Now I can put those two surfaces down and you can see how out of square that is. So I've gotta come over here. And I can just hack away at that. Now, I made purposely made that surf side to be nice and square and flat so that I could plane and have it held firmly to the fence and to the bottom of the shooting board. You could see how that last go round it was wobbling on me. But I'm just having to cut a little chamfer on the back side so I don't blow that out. Okay, so that's nice and square. I'll do the same thing on this one. That's the way we want it to sit. So we've got to turn it this way first. Cut a little chamfer, spin it around. And that's nice and square. Not square all the way over, but we're only going to use in here. All right, just give me a second. I'll get caught up with this piece and we'll be ready to go over to the drill press. Okay, the first thing I need to do is find my center mark. And the easiest way to do that is just draw a line between opposite corners. Now I've got a little jig that I use for drilling square stock round. So I'll put that in there. And the bit that I'm using is a 9.6 millimeter. Now the connecting rod is exactly 3 of an inch, 0.375. And the problem is most drill bits, 3 drill bits are slightly under so it makes it too tight. We found that a 9.6 mil gives you exactly what you need, just enough clearance to get that down. Now I normally would clamp this down if I was going to do a lot of these, but since I'm only doing one, put that right on the center. Allow for chip clearance and ear protection. All right, there we go. But I'm going to put that in there now first. And it is a tight fit. Hope I can get it out. And then I'll just trace around that. And that'll allow me to get really close. And I like them to fit perfectly. I, I really don't like it when you can feel any kind of a ridge of the cap. And we'll screw this on. And then I'll just trace around this. And that'll allow me to get close. Like I said, I'll start and stop taking it off each time in order to get it precise. If you wanted to, you could cut the corners off, go over and it's kind of a dangerous operation, but you could if you, on the table saw, you could do it on the band saw. You could even do it with a plane, knock those corners off. But you do a little bit of turning and you can get pretty accustomed to taking them off on the lathe without an issue. Now I'm going to tween, turn this between centers and you'll see what I'm using. 
There's no teeth. It's just a pointed center. There'll be enough pressure and I'm going to turn easy enough that I don't have to worry about it. And you turn a material like that, you got to turn it carefully anyway you're going to tear it. So we'll put that in there and bring the tailstock up. Now I've actually got a couple of shims and you may find this. I don't know why they don't make uh, wood turning lays a little more accurate, but I need these two shims in order to line those two points up closer than they would otherwise. And this is a, uh, this was an expensive lathe, so this is not something because of the price. Uh, I think I'll turn this way. This would be the small end out here. Lock that in place. Now, I may have to tighten it up a little bit more. In fact, I'm going to tighten this up a little bit too. I want my tool rest. Obviously, I have to clear the piece of wood. And I want to be just a little bit below half. That's all right. Make sure that's good and firm. Now I'm going to use a skew chisel. That should be sharp enough. And small diameter, I want to turn fairly high RPM. It's all about rim speed. If it was a large diameter piece, you've got a lot of wood passing by the tip of your tool as it spins, even at a low RPM. So smaller diameter, you've got to turn, increase the RPM. So we're going to go in here and just knock off those corners. So my first task will be to get this round. Now you can feel there's not a whole lot of bite, but if you go easy, and I'm purposely doing that because of the material, there'll be enough grip to keep that moving under the pressure of the cutting edge. And when you're using a skew chisel, you want the bevel, this part right here, is going to rest on the wood, and that's what's going to guide your cutting. It'll control the depth of your cut. You're typically using the bottom half, safer maybe even with the bottom third, at least in this position. There are times when you come in here and use the point. And what I do, do is set the chisel up on top, and if it's round, it doesn't vibrate. I can still feel a little bit of vibration right there. Let's stop and see if I'm right. Say so we still have some of the rough exterior right there, and we still got some of the tear out. So we'll go a little bit further and see if we can't clean that up. If you want to, you can, you can move your tool rest in. Now I've had to put mine on a little bit of an angle so I would catch the ways on both sides and still have the tool rest out far enough to catch the far end of the handle. That could use a little bit of work. Rather than risk it on something like this, and I check in the description below, I've shown how to sharpen a skew chisel. I'm going to go over and just give that a little bit of, a couple of seconds of work and then we'll come right back. But that's already starting to look nice. That really lights up. Now I changed my chisel. The uh, jig that I had, well it's not a jig, I usually do it on my, on my disc sander. The distance it was set up was the wrong one, so I have to re completely redo the bevel on that other chisel. I prefer that bevel to be nice and flat rather than any kind of a, uh, a uh, uh, hollow ground. Just, it's, it's, I find it more reliable or more predictable when it actually comes to turning. You know where, exactly where it's going to make contact. Now, I'm not following any particular pattern. I'm just going to make something that I think is pleasing to both the hand and the eye. And you can do whatever you want, obviously. Now I can see that pencil mark. 
down here and I'm still an eighth of an inch away from it. And I'll come up here and just start wearing away some of that. I really like to take this or get this so that it is minimal sanding. In other words, try to get it as tool smooth as you can. Now I don't have a whole lot of room and I want a nice flowing curve. You don't want any flats, at least I don't. I can still see I've got about a 32nd of an inch there. Now I gotta blend that in over here. Trying to keep that from, from vibrating. So just the first thing you got to do is learn to lay that tool on there so the bevel is touching. And then you can just rotate up and in until your chisel starts to make contact. The point edge starts to make contact. And you're shearing wood, so you should be pulling off shavings as opposed to dust. A lot of folks scrape with carbide tools, and that's fine, but it's never going to give you the kind of finish that you can get off a sharp skew. I'll show you what I mean. That's a nice smooth, now there's a little bit of tear right here, so if I can't get rid of that with the chisel, I'm going to have to make sure I leave enough in order to sand. But I think I can go even easier. I've still got about a sixteenth over here. That's just going to allow me to develop the shape a little more. And depending on the size of your hand, you may want to have in fact, I'm going to have a closer look at that. Wouldn't hurt to take that off. Nice thing about using these two cone centers, you don't have to worry about putting it back on. No matter what you do, it's going to go back to the same spot. And by the way, I went through and I looked some, at some other uh, connecting rods, and this one actually fits a little bit better. It goes in there just nicely. So I'm going to put this together and just see how it feels. And I realize I still have a lot of material to remove down there, but I just... If you had a big hand, you'd want something that diameter. I'm going to take a little more material. I'm going to take a little more material through the middle. And then slope it down. Now, if you're planning on doing a whole set, then you need to go through, make a pattern, and what I would do is actually take a thin piece of, of plywood and cut that pattern out so that as you're turning each one, you can take that little piece of plywood and put it in and hold it up against the profile of what you're turning. And then you'll end up with a shape that's at least close by eye when they're sitting in your tool rack. Now I can't put too much pressure because you don't want to split that. But So a little more off here. Remember, I'm purposely taking a very small amount to try to avoid any uh, more tears. Just want to level that bump out a little bit. It'd be nice if I could actually bring it down to that line and have it close enough. Now I've got to shut it off to see. Okay, so I still have pencil. And I still have a bit of pencil up there, not much.
if you feel that vibration and what's going on there is just because that grain is actually there's some hard soft hard soft and it you gotta be careful or else your chisel actually follows it so the only way to get I find the easiest way to get through it is to come up behind it and then cut underneath it Now I'm not in a rush, I want this to look right. Okay, I don't see any tear. We still have a little bit of the pencil line on both top and bottom. Let's put that in and see what it looks like. Now, you may think that's a little bit too fat through here. It feels pretty good. I still have, I still got a little bit of excess material down there to get rid of. And I still have just a little bit. I want to, I don't want to get underneath the, uh, the, the end cap. So I, I have a little bit more to turn off the top. And then by the looks of it, it won't take a whole lot of turning to get that surface perfect. Maybe start with 220 and finish with some 320 and maybe a little bit of 400. You can see how it would be nice to actually have a block or a, a man, uh, not a mandrel, but I uh, can't think of the word I want, but a piece that you would squeeze this between front and back or one end and the other, and you would simply turn down to that. And if it's something like brass, well, you can accidentally touch it with your chisel and it's not going to wreck your chisel. You got to be able to turn in both directions. So if you're practicing to get to the point where you're able to do this, especially turning with a skew, you've got to be able to turn to your left and to your right. Now, I think that might be done. This one, can you move your camera for a minute? I get my head in there. I think I still have a little more to go. I'm also tempted to take a little bit of that bump off right through here. Something I learned from Richard Raffin was not to have a death grip on your chisel. Feel it, hold it comfortably enough that you can actually feel through the tool what's happening at the cutting edge. And I'm purposely taking a very small cut. And no, I'm not turning these for a living, so it doesn't matter how long it takes me. Okay, that's, that's really close. I think there's just enough there to sand to a finish. And we're still proud just a little bit, not much, just a maybe even as little as a 64th of an inch. You want these ends to be nice and square. That's why I say it's a lot easier to start with them already squared than just drill your hole. You can square them up on the lathe, but then in this case, you're turning down into a metal center. just want to pick up ever so slight an amount.
when you're turning, you really need to focus on up here. Watch your profile up here. You have to forget about your tool. You got to get to a point where you can feel and know where, what the tool is doing without looking at it. Because if you're watching the tool where it's cutting the wood, you're not able to see your profile and what's going on up there. I'm going to take that off one more time and check it. I want it to be just a little bit proud. Got to put this back together each time in order to accurately do this. Okay, that's in there nice. That's beautiful. Oh, that fits lovely. I, I, I like the look of this. I really do. All right, now we don't want to overkill it with sandpaper. And like I said, that's, that's close enough off of the lathe. And that's a big advantage of learning to use that skew. You can get to a point where you just have to do a little bit of work with sandpaper and you're not having to seriously alter your shape. It's a lot easier, I think, to get your shape off of the tool than it is off of the sandpaper. So do it that way. Now I'm going to turn the uh, dust collector on and that'll suck up all of our dust while we're sanding. Okay, I want a piece of 220 and 320. I'm going to get a new sheet. Just fold that in half so it gives you a little stiffer backing. Now you want to be careful not to lose that nice crisp edge there and there. So when you're sanding down to it, just be aware of that. Keep moving. And keep moving on the sandpaper so that you're not, you're not uh, wearing one spot. Have a look. Hey, that feels good. Now we'll go on to 320. And I might even scrounge up a piece of 400, as I mentioned. I like to do this so that I'm holding. I like to sand on the top side. I don't know why, just out of habit, maybe and support the paper from with my opposite hand down underneath and then uh, you're not getting burnt that stuff heats up really fast protect those nice sharp corners all right let me go find a piece of 400 we'll come back do that I'm gonna grab some tongue oil and we'll at least get our first coat on now I like to fold this stuff twice and it just gives you a little more of a backing so that it's not your fingers that are applying the pressure it's a little better dispersed because of the stiffness of the four layers shouldn't take a lot all you're doing is chasing away the 320 grit scratches. And since this is 400, it's close enough. Not much difference. Now, I can shut that air off. I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna sand by hand, just rotating it as I do it, in the direction that the grain runs, just so you don't have those circular scratches. You don't always see them, but sometimes on some of the woods that uh, are harder, they'll show up. Again, I'm just, I'm kind of stretching the paper like this when I was doing it with my hand so that you're, you're uh, working a larger surface and you're applying the pressure evenly. Want to keep that nice and sharp. Now I, I 
I'm gonna put oil on here. I use a tongue oil. Really like it. It's gonna take five or six coats over the course of four or five days. Usually, actually, it's a, a, a day to dry. And if you don't do that on blonde woods, especially if you're using an oil finish, you'll end up having dirt from your hand. Put a patina on there that you might not want. So you get five, four or five coats of that oil that'll give you some, some protection. Okay, now I got a rag. Brush off that oil. Now I'm going to turn this on, but I'm going to, I've got a variable speed, which is nice. I'll just turn it down so it's barely turning. And this is the tongue oil that I use. It's made by Circa 1850. And I don't know what it is, but I've used it for a long time, and I love the way it, it finishes. I'm just going to use a foam brush. That is a really pretty piece of wood. Amazing what lies under the bark. However, a lot of times bird's eye and quilted or figured ma uh, fiddleback maple like this actually comes right through into the bark. So if you know what you're looking for, you can spot it in the standing tree. Now I'll saturate this and then I would let it sit for a couple of minutes, soak in. You don't want it to get tacky. If it does, you can just put on another coat to help soften it up and then buff it off. And every day I'll come in and do the same thing. Apply a coat, let it sit there for a few minutes, buff it off. And you'll really notice about the fourth or fifth time you really start to get a little bit of what we would call a top coat. Whereas if you stop with one, it always feels like it really doesn't have a finish on it. It's got that wet look, but it doesn't have that finished feel. Now, for the sake of time, we'll uh, at least put this together with this one coat on just so you can get a look at it and see what it turns out like. I'm hurrying things up a little bit, but... That's soaking into the wood so it's not going to lay on the surface. So when I'm done, it'll be dry to the touch. But the more you put on, the more it saturates that top bit of wood, and then it starts to actually sit on the surface a little bit, and you'll get that little bit of sheen. I don't like shiny, but I do like what we might call a semi-gloss. Let's stick that out. Make sure you get those threads lined up properly. Now, if the light gets that just right, that is a pretty piece of what I would call fiddleback, or you could just call it figured maple. There you go. Easy. Uh, if you like my work, if you like my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos to help take your woodworking to the next level. And I've always said better tools make it a whole lot easier. If you click on the icon with the plane and the chisel, it'll take you to our website, introduce you to all of our tools, and also talk to you about our online and in-person workshops. Good luck in your woodwork.